Anna with Folksy Tales, and on this channel I talk about stories, in particular folk tales, beliefs, and mythologies. If you're interested in Tolkien lore, I am currently working my way through the Silmarillion, feel free to check out my channel, The Folksy Friend, right up here. Today we are talking about a Russian fairy tale. This is the tale Vasilisa the Beautiful. Once upon a time there was a merchant who had been married to his lovely wife for 12 years. Despite this, they only had one child, and that child was named Vasilisa, and she was known as Vasilisa the Beautiful. Now, when Vasilisa was eight years old, her mother unfortunately became very, very ill, and on her deathbed, she called her daughter to her. She told Vasilisa that, that along with her mother's blessing, she had for her a special doll, and she gave Vasilisa this doll from where she held it under the covers. She told Vasilisa that she was to keep this doll with her always, and she should never tell anyone about it. She then told Vasilisa if she was ever in trouble, she should feed the doll and ask it for advice. Once the doll had eaten, it would be able to comfort her and give her advice and help that she needed. After this, her mother passed away. After some time had passed and the merchant mourned the passing of his wife, he decided that he should marry again. Despite the fact that he had the pick of the town, being a very handsome, pretty young widower, he decided on an older widow because she had two daughters that were only a little older than Vasilisa and he thought she would be a perfect homemaker and mother to his daughter. Unfortunately, however, it didn't quite work out that way. The stepmother and stepsisters were fiercely jealous of Vasilisa and how beautiful she was. And almost immediately, they started giving her grueling work and none too secretly hoped that by giving her this work, she would become thin and frail from being worked so hard and her skin would become tanned and unsightly from being outside in the sun all day. However, despite this plan, Vasilisa only continued to grow more and more beautiful as the years went by, whereas the stepmother and stepsisters became sickly and frail because they were consumed with spite and bitterness. And this was all because Vasilisa had her mother's doll. Vasilisa would keep all the best food for the doll, sometimes not even eating to ensure that the doll had the best pieces she could offer. And each night she would feed her doll and she would tell her doll all about the troubles she had experienced that day, all about her stepmother's cruelty and the impossible amount of work that she had been asked to do. The doll would eat the food and then it would comfort her. And the following day, the doll would do all of the difficult chores that Vasilisa was supposed to do, while Vasilisa herself would sit in the shade and pick flowers. The doll even helped her figure out which herbs she needed to prevent sunburn from being outside for so long. Years passed like this, and in time, Vasilisa became a marriageable age. And because of her just stunning beauty, every single eligible bachelor in the town wanted to court her. However, this made her stepmother very angry, and she began to shoo away the suitors, declaring that Vasilisa was not to be married before her older sisters. Every time the stepmother had to send a suitor away, she would take out her rage and beat her stepdaughter mercilessly. Now it came time that one day the merchant, Vasilisa's father, had to go away on business and he would be gone for quite some time. And so at this time the family moved to a new home and this new home happened to be beside a very dense dark forest. And it was well known that deep in this forest, in a clearing, was the hut of the witch Baba Yaga. Everyone knew that Baba Yaga would eat anyone who came too close to their home. And because of this, the stepmother would often send Vasilisa into the woods, getting random things that she may need. However, Vasilisa always came back safely. And this was because she had her doll and her doll would give her the best paths, the best routes to take that were safe and where she could avoid Baba Yaga. Clearly seeing that her plan was not working, oh, we have a guest, the stepmother decided it was time to change up her plan. 
And so that autumn, when the days began to shorten, she assigned all three girls of the house with important evening work that they would do by candlelight. She would light one candle for them in the room that they worked and put out every other candle in the house. Why? Save on the wax, I guess. Wax was pretty expensive back then. Yeah. Then the stepmother herself would go to bed, but not before telling the girls that they had to complete all of their work before they themselves went to bed. The eldest daughter was assigned to make lace. The middle daughter was assigned to knit stockings and Vasilisa was assigned the spinning. One night as they worked, the candle began to smoke and the eldest daughter, as she knew how to do, took a pair of scissors to trim down the candle. But this was part of a greater plan. And as she trimmed down the candle, she made it seem like an accident when she put the fire out. Then the sisters became upset. They told Vasilisa that they had not finished their work. Someone would have to go and get light from Baba Yaga's hut. It's apparently relighting the candle was not an option. The eldest sister said, oh, the pins on my lace work, they provide enough light, I, shall, I won't go. The second sister said, oh, my, my knitting needles, they provide me enough light, I won't go. Vasilisa, you are the one who must go. You're the only one that doesn't have glowing needlewear, I would, the sound thinking that's going on here. Hang on. For those of you who are wondering about how shiny a knitting needle could possibly be, this is one of my knitting needles and it is a heck of a lot shinier than um, they would have had. I'd love to know what kind of magic eyes these stepsisters had to be able to knit and do lace work. What would it even reflect on? The light's out. Okay. Yeah, I know. So something... Let's leave it at that, back to the story. So the sisters threw Vasilisa out of the room telling her that she had to go to Baba Yaga's hut. Vasilisa, terrified and understandably so, took what little dinner she had back to her tiny little room where she lived and gave it to her doll. And she cried, telling the doll that she had to go face the dangerous witch Baba Yaga and that surely she would be eaten. But once the doll had eaten its fill, it told her not to worry. You must take me with you, Vasilisushka. I will protect you. You must always keep me in your pocket. And with that, Vasilisa got ready, put on her coat, put her doll in her pocket, and off she went. She was terrified and had no light to guide her. I'm not even sure how she managed to make it without bumping into a tree. If you've ever been in the woods at night, it's very dark. But she managed to stumble through the night until suddenly, without warning, past her at a gallop went a white knight. His horse was white. His skin was white. All of his clothes were white. Even his saddle and the trappings on the horse were white. And of course she thought this was strange, but, but she kept walking and dawn broke around her. Not long later, a red horse galloped by. Now this horse was red, the rider was red, all of his clothes and the trappings on the horse were red. And as he went by, the sun rose. Vasilisa kept walking all throughout the next day until finally that evening, she reached the clearing in which sat Baba Yaga's hut. Now around this hut was a fence that was made entirely of human bones. And on the spikes that topped the fence, were human skulls staring outward. The hut itself had doors that were made of human legs for doorposts, hands for door bolts, and in the place of locks were mouths with sharp teeth. And Vasilisa was horrified. She was completely frozen to the spot in terror, as I would be too. Then, all of a sudden, from behind her came galloping a third horse. This time, the horse was black. The rider was black. His clothes were black, and so were all the trappings on the horse. And as she watched, he galloped straight towards Baba Yaga's door and disappeared. And with him, evening fell around her. As the sky began to darken, 
The skulls on the fence around Baba Yaga's hut began to glow from their eye sockets, and soon the entire clearing was lit as if it were daylight. Soon loud sounds came coming from the woods around her, and as Vasilisa stood, still completely frozen in fear, Baba Yaga emerged from the woods in her massive mor- Sorry, sorry, it's not funny. It, it's just the imagery for me. Oh, bless you, Captain. Baba Yaga came out of the woods in her massive mortar, pushing herself along with her pestle and sweeping up the tracks of her mortar behind her with a broom. She came all the way into her clearing and stopped at the gate, then declared out loud that she could smell a Russian smell and demanded to know who was there. Finally, Vasilisa came out of the shadows and towards the house. She told Baba Yaga that she was there because her stepsisters ordered her to bring light from Baba Yaga's hut. Baba Yaga responded, oh yes, I know your stepsisters, that's fine, come on in. I will give you the light, but only if you live with me and serve me. If you don't, I will eat you. And following really the only option she had, Vasilisa followed Baba Yaga up to the gate. Baba Yaga demanded that the gate open for her, and it did. Baba Yaga then closed the gate behind them, and they entered the hut. Once inside, Baba Yaga ordered Vasilisa to serve her all the food from the stove, and Vasilisa did as she was told. She lit a torch using one of the skulls from outside and then served Baba Yaga enough food to feed 10 people. Vasilisa herself was only left a small bit of cabbage soup, a little bit of pork and a crust of bread, which she saved. Before going to sleep that night, Baba Yaga told her that in the morning, she must do a series of tasks. And if she did not complete these tasks, Baba Yaga would eat her. Baba Yaga told Vasilisa she must sweep the yard, clean the hut, cook dinner, wash the linens, and then sort out a bushel of wheat from the corn bin. And with those instructions, Baba Yaga went to sleep. Vasilisa then took out her doll and fed it from the meal that she had been given and lamented that she was terrified. She couldn't do all this work and she thought Baba Yaga was going to eat her but the doll told her it's gonna be okay. Have some food, go to sleep. The morning, things will be better. Early the next morning, Vasilisa awoke not long after Baba Yaga had left the hut and Vasilisa went and looked out the window. As she watched, the white rider appeared from seemingly out of the earth and shot out riding towards the forest. And with him, dawn broke across the sky. Then Baba Yaga whistled, and in front of her appeared her mortar, pestle, and a broom. Then the Red Rider appeared and shot out into the forest, and with him the sun began to rise. Then Baba Yaga hopped into her mortar and began to push herself off into the woods as she did, sweeping up her tracks with the broom. With all of that done, Vasilisa looked around trying to figure out what she was going to do first on her massive list of chores, but she found that everything had already been done. And she looked down to see her little doll climbing into her pocket. Little doll told her, all that's left is for you to cook dinner tonight. And once you do that, you should take a rest, you know, keep up your strength. And so Vasilisa thanked her doll and did as she was told. That night she had dinner ready and she made up the table, then waited for Baba Yaga to return. Later that afternoon, as she was watching by the window, Vasilisa saw the black rider appear from the forest and ride straight as if he was going to go through Baba Yaga's door. But again, he disappeared. And behind him, evening began to darken the sky. Not long later, after the torches, the glowing skull lights began to light, she heard Baba Yaga making her way through the forest again. When Baba Yaga came into her home, she saw all the chores had been done, expertly, and she was pretty annoyed that there was nothing she could complain about and that she couldn't eat Vasilisa. So she called for her servants, her dear friends, to come to grind up the wheat. And suddenly, three pairs of hands appeared. They took the wheat that the doll had taken from the corn bin and seemed to disappear with it. And Vasilisa watched, but she didn't say anything. After Baba Yaga had eaten her dinner, she turned to Vasilisa and said, 
you're going to do the same thing you did today again yesterday. But I also want you to go to the poppy seed bin and I want you to clear all of the dust out of it, grain by grain, seed by seed, get rid of all of the dust. Someone threw dust in there just, you know, to be mean. Definitely wasn't me, no way, no. And if you don't, I'm gonna eat you. And again, Baba Yaga went to sleep and Vasilisa fed her doll and relayed her fears. Again, the doll told her, it's going to be okay. You're going to be okay. Have something to eat and go to sleep. The next day, Vasilisa again watched as the two riders, white and red, went off from this, the earth, seemingly, and then Baba Yaga left. The doll had already done her chores again, and that evening Baba Yaga returned to a sparkling hut and all the chores done. This time when she sat down to eat, she looked at Vasilisa and she said, why aren't you speaking to me? You don't want to make conversation? You don't want to talk? And Vasilisa responded, understandably, that she dare not start a conversation. She didn't want to be rude. But if Baba Yaga wanted her to speak, she did have a question. And to that, Baba Yaga responded, yeah, okay, ask your question, but be warned. Not every question has a good answer. And if you know too much, you may very soon grow old. To this, Vasilisa asked her questions about the writers. She told Baba Yaga that on her way to the hut, she had seen a rider that was all in white with a white horse and she asked who it was. And Baba Yaga answered, he is my bright day. Then Vasilisa said, I also saw another rider. This one was all in red with a red horse. Who is that? To which Baba Yaga responded, he is my red son. And finally, Vasilisa asked, when I came close to your home, I saw a black rider with a black horse and black clothing. Who is that? And Baba Yaga responded, he is my dark knight, and all three of these are my faithful servants. At hearing this, Vasilisa thought about the hands that appeared and how Baba Yaga had called them her faithful servants. But she didn't continue in her questioning. She didn't say anything. But Baba Yaga prompted her and she said, do you have any other questions? To which Vasilisa responded, no, no, it's okay. You've warned me that, you know, if I know too much, I may soon grow old. And Baba Yaga smiled at this. She said, it is clever of you to only ask of things that you have seen outside my home, not inside my home. I do not like having my dirty linens washed in public. And I eat those who are overly curious. Vasilisa really dodged a bullet there. But then Baba Yaga says, I've answered your questions. I have one for you. How is it that you managed to clean this place and do all these chores so perfectly? And Vasilisa responded, remembering that she could not tell anyone about the doll, that it was by the help of her mother's blessing that she was able to do this. And that made Baba Yaga very upset. She immediately jumped to her feet and started screaming that she did not want a blessed person in this house, that Vasilisa must leave now. And she dragged the girl outside, handed her a skull from on top of the fence and said, you came for light, there's your light, get out. Vasilisa, having completed her task and survived, took the skull and ran into the woods, understandably. She ran all through the night and when morning came, the skull's light went out but she carried it with her all the way through the day and to the next evening when she finally got home to her stepmother's house. As she reached the gate, she thought about just tossing the skull away because it wasn't bright anymore. She didn't think she needed it. But before she did, the skull said to her, uh uh, don't throw me away, give me to your stepmother. And listening to the talking skull from the cannibal witch's house as she should, Vasilisa kept the skull. When she went to the door, she found that for the first time in her life, her stepmother and stepsisters were happy to see her. They told her that something terrible had happened. Ever since she left, left, implying that she had a choice, they could not keep a fire going in their home. Every time they tried to spark an ember, it wouldn't spark. And every time they had someone bring fire into the house from outside, it immediately went out and they didn't know what to do. So they hoped that with this 
magical Baba Yaga skull light, they could light the fireplace and everything would be back to normal. And so Vasilisa did as she was asked. She carried the skull into the living room, but no sooner had she come before them that the skull stared at the stepmother and the stepsisters and began to burn them. They cried and tried to get away, but everywhere they went, it would stare at them and they continued to burn until by dawn, there was nothing left but ash. Vasilisa herself was unharmed and she took the skull, locked up the house and buried the skull outside and then went into town as if none, none of that had happened. There was an older woman who lived in the village and she did not have children. And this woman took Vasilisa in to provide for her and give her a roof over her head until Vasilisa's father returned. After a little while of being with this older woman, Vasilisa told her that she just couldn't sit still without doing anything. So she asked the old woman to go out and buy the best flax that the woman could afford. Vasilisa would spin it for her. And so the old woman went and did as she was asked. She bought some flax, brought it back to Vasilisa, and Vasilisa began to spin. Now she spun so fast, faster than really should be possible. And she spun out yarn that was perfectly even and as fine and thin as a strand of hair, which is pretty much impossible, but it was phenomenal. Then she wanted to weave her yarn together and make a fine linen, but she could not find a comb that was thin enough for the yarn that she had made. And so she went to her doll for help. And the doll told her, all you have to do is go get an old comb, an old shuttle, and a mane of horse's hair. Leave it for me and I will build you something to use. So when she had all those things, overnight the doll set about creating a magnificent loom. Then Vasilisa awoke and began her work. By the time winter was over, she had woven together all of the yarn into beautiful sheets of linen. And that spring, she bleached them so they were ready for sale. She gave these sheets to the old woman and told her to sell them so that the old woman could keep the profits. But the old woman saw how just magnificent this fabric was and told Vasilisa, the only one who can wear something this fine is the Tsar. He's the only one who can wear this. So I will go bring it to him. The old woman went to the home of the Tsar. He spotted this old woman wandering around outside his windows and peeked out to her and said, "What? why are you here? She said, I have these for you, but I only want to show them to you. Their quality is so fine and special. And he agreed to see her. He was amazed by the quality of the cloth and wanted to pay her, but she said that no, he was essentially owed this because he was the Tsar. He was the only one fine enough to wear such fine fabric. And so these were a gift. He took them gratefully and he gave her many gifts in return. And then the old woman left. The Tsar wanted these cloths to be made into fine shirts for him, but they could not find a seamstress who was willing to do the work. And after searching far and wide and no one wanting to make these shirts or being able to, he had no choice but to call the old woman back. And he told her, you are skilled enough to make cloth this fine, so you must be able to sew it. I want you to make shirts for me. And she explained to him that she wasn't the one who had done this, that there was a young girl who was staying with her, she was providing for, who had done the work. And the Tsar said, oh, fine, whatever, have her do it. Go get the shirts done. And so the old woman brought home the fabric to Vasilisa and she told her what the Tsar wanted. Vasilisa responded that uh, she knew that she was gonna be the one to do the sewing. She, she had a feeling this was gonna happen. And then she shut herself away in her room and worked without rest until a dozen magnificent shirts were finished. Once the work was done, she gave these shirts back to the old woman who took them to the Tsar. While the old woman was gone, Vasilisa prettied herself up, washed, put on her best clothes, did her hair, and she waited, having a feeling that something was gonna happen. As she sat in the window, a messenger from the Tsar came to her and told her, Tsar is so amazed by this beautiful work that he wants to thank you in person. So come with me. 
And so Vasilisa followed, and the moment the Tsar laid eyes on her, he was blown away, enchanted by her beauty, and he fell deeply in love with her. He took her hand and told her that from that moment, he would not be parted with her. And he married her on the spot. Not that much long later, Vasilisa's father returned, and both he and the old woman who had helped her went to live with her. Presumably, he didn't go home and find the ash spot that was his second wife. Or he did, and he didn't care. Mm. Either way, they lived in great happiness, and Vasilisa kept her mother's doll with her for the rest of her life. And that was the story of Vasilisa the Beautiful. This one was so interesting because, of course, it immediately reminded me of Cinderella at the beginning with the, the death of the mother and then the stepmother and the stepsisters using her for labor. But then instead of a fairy godmother, we kind of, well, we have the doll, which is kind of like a fairy godmother. I found it very interesting that it only ever does its magic thing seemingly at night which makes me wonder, like, is the doll actually doing these things? Or is it just like snap its little doll fingers and then the work is done? I don't know, it's interesting. But we also have, instead of just the stepmother being the villain, we have Baba Yaga, who is endlessly fascinating to me. And if you want to watch a video that I have of her, feel free to click on that. She is such an interesting character because despite being a terrifying cannibal witch, who is truly, truly scary, she's not just some old woman in the woods, like she's scary. You heard the description of the house, but she's not evil. She doesn't set out to be bad. She's just living her cannibal witch life and Captain just stomping around the room. And it's only if people bother her that she really messes with them. And if you do what she wants and you get her help, there's nothing, well, there is something to fear because if you mess up, she'll kill you, but there isn't anything to fear in the sense that, like, she's gonna... Captain... No, 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 no. Especially in the case of, like, Vasilisa, she did as she was asked, she got what she came for. So, it's just interesting to see such a scary, scary person be kind of morally gray. Captain... Hi, sorry for the sudden uh, shirt and camera angle change. Uh, Captain made it impossible to finish filming yesterday. He needed attention then and there, so it is the next day and I'm finishing up with the rest of my info. So with that being said, Vasilisa the Beautiful was one of the fairy tales that was collected by Alexander Nikolaevich Afanasyev, who did his collecting between 1855 and 1864. This story has been adopted into countless novels, short stories, a play, and interestingly, a lot of comics, more comics than I've seen in any of the other stories that I've looked into. And I have to think it's because of Vasilisa's just striking iconography, the girl in the woods with the skull. It's pretty easy and pretty um, recognizable for anyone who knows the story. Also, if you have read the Vampire Academy series, Vasilisa the Beautiful was the name inspiration behind the character Vasilisa. Now, when looking into the background of this story, I learned a lot about Russian fairy tales and folk tales in general, and it was very interesting. There is a different kind of history and tradition around folk tales in Russia than there is in really the rest of Europe or a lot of other places that I have looked into. And that is because it was not typical to write down folk tales or fairy tales or songs or poems in actual written form. Not until the 1600s was it really even attempted, and then it wasn't really done until the 1800s. And that's pretty different from a lot of other places where we have written records that go back much, much further than the 1800s. And because of this, when the stories were actually written down, as is the case in any fairy tale, the actual writer is going to have an influence over how the story is written down. They're going to tweak things. They may do some editing. That typically always happens with fairy tales, unless it's a skilled anthropologist who's just going to write it down word for word. They were not doing that in the 1800s. They were making tweaks. And because of that, there are a couple of interesting things that I learned that may have been altered from potentially the original story or original variations. And that is the connection between Baba Yaga 
and Vasilisa in terms of pagan religion and Christianity. And that was something that I thought was super interesting. Some sources say that Baba Yaga is the embodiment of pagan belief and that she is the pagan wild woman. In fact, Baba Yaga, way back in her mythology, originated as a pagan goddess of rebirth and regeneration. So she was, in her own time, very, very powerful. In time, however, the idea of Baba Yaga as being a wild but not evil entity that lived in the forest became very much an evil old witch narrative. And that is, of course, because Christianity came along and supplanted a lot of pagan beliefs. And so Christianity, being highly patriarchal, would not accept someone like Baba Yaga as a, a good or even really neutral force. And so she became much more of the evil witch that lurks out in the woods and eats children. But that becomes very interesting in this particular story because there is a very clear moment when Baba Yaga faces a new world Christian belief, which is the blessing that Vasilisa has, and clearly is repelled by it. Some scholars say that this is a sign among storytellers to show that Baba Yaga is clearly the at least lesser if not evil force here and that Vasilisa having the Christian blessing is the more righteous good or better force and that Baba Yaga cannot stand to be near her because of this. Interestingly however one fantastic author if you are ever interested in any of this kind of thing she's great her name is Clarissa Pincola Estes and she wrote this book, Women Who Run With the Wolves. And this story, actually, Vasilisa the Beautiful, though she calls it Vasilisa the Wise, she wrote about how Vasilisa's story is one of female empowerment, how she starts off as being kind of weak and demure, not really knowing anything about the world, and then through the help of this wise woman, Baba Yaga, she gets the knowledge that she needs to control her own fate and her own destiny. And that is ultimately why the stepmother and the stepsisters die. Estes, however, instead of saying that it is religion that repels Baba Yaga from Vasilisa, says that it is actually more of a wild magic versus a sweet, innocent kind of magic, that they just don't jive together. That the goodness, the wholesomeness of Vasilisa's blessing that came from her too pure for this world mother, repels just the inherent wildness of Baba Yaga. And that it wasn't to do with pagan versus Christian, it was to do with wild magic versus innocent and sweet, blessed magic. Which I think is just super interesting to consider how the story may have changed over time, from the time where pagan beliefs were the norm, to the time where pagan beliefs were warring with Christian beliefs in these types of stories. And this is also something super interesting to consider when you think about Vasilisa's doll, because her doll is actually a type of folk craft. It is a type of rag doll, which is traditionally a doll which is made out of scraps around the house. And this type of doll in particular is called a motanka. And that is a type of Slavic folk craft, typically associated with Ukraine, but also just in general, that, that area of the world. And this doll is made specifically as a talisman that houses the spirits of the ancestors and protects the family, in particular, the one who has the doll. This doll is made by no needlework. It is made by just wrapping the elements. And that is to not hurt the fate that is assigned to the doll. And it is given a purpose, like protection, and then passed down from mother to daughter. Not only is it a protection symbol, but it also helps the women with their work, with their cleaning, with their health, with their overall life and fortune. These are symbols and talismans that are supposed to help those they are owned by. And that is not a Christian belief. This is a Slavic folk belief, and it is definitely a force for good in this story. We are not supposed to see Vasilisa's doll as being an evil thing. So, if Baba Yaga is meant to be 
evil as a pagan symbol, why is the doll then not also evil as a pagan symbol? It makes me think that maybe that Baba Yaga was never really intended to be evil and that that kind of moment of her freaking out of Vasilisa has been changed to make it seem like she was more afraid instead of just like, ew, sweet magic, can't handle that. I, it makes me think that as fairy tales do, it evolved over time. I hope that all made sense. That was very rambly, but I hope it made sense. I, I find these things so interesting. Sometimes I get a little carried away. So if you didn't find that interesting, I shall move on now. No, I won't. Sorry. There's one more thing. The torch also, the skull torch. Skulls were seen in a lot of pagan beliefs as symbols and holders of the spirit. And the idea of the eyes really being kind of the hub of power. So as a symbol of knowledge and a holder of spirits, Baba Yaga kind of literally passes a torch of knowledge from herself to Vasilisa. And then Vasilisa uses this to impact her own destiny, to destroy, although I don't think she means to. She does, I mean, ultimately her stepmother and stepsisters die and that is good for Vasilisa. She no longer has to deal with them. And as another pagan element here. So yet again, if pagan is supposed to be bad, why isn't the doll and the skull bad? It could just be one of those things where there's that overlap because there were still a lot of overlapping beliefs that some elements of Christianity, some elements of more traditional beliefs, and it just kind of comes together in this story, you know, little bits and pieces. That's also very possible. Let me know what you think. Do you think we're supposed to think that the pagan side of what's going on here is bad? Or is it just some beliefs are cool, Baba Yaga's not? Or is Baba Yaga, as I believe, supposed to be seen as more of a neutral force that you just don't mess with? She's too scary to mess with, but she's not going to come out and eat you for fun, you know? One last thing that I think it is interesting to point out is that the original collector of the stories, Alexander, whose last name I'm having a really hard time pronouncing, so I'm just going to call him Alexander. He's 200 years or so dead, so hopefully he won't mind. He personally saw fairy tales as kind of a way to interpret and to explain nature. And so to him, the story of Vasilisa the Beautiful was a story of light triumphing over darkness. And the light in this case, obviously being Vasilisa, but the darkness was not Baba Yaga. The darkness was her stepmother and stepsisters. And the light actually came from Baba Yaga. So to him, at least, it seemed like it wasn't necessarily some sort of Christian versus paganism thing going on here. It was more of just a good versus evil, light versus dark situation. It's bigger than religion, I would say. It's an, an overall fundamental good versus bad. And take from that what you will. Those are my thoughts. Let me know what you think. I really want to do more and more research into the intersection between pagan and Christian beliefs in Russian fairy tales because it is so interesting to me. You could probably tell because I rambled a lot. But let me know if that is something that interests you. Otherwise, I won't bother putting it in a story. I'll just do it for my own fun. <laughs> so thank you for spending some time with me here today. I hope I will see you next week. I haven't decided on next week's fairy tale just yet, but I think I'll be going back to the Brothers Grimm just for, just for that week because those are some of my favorites. Again, if you are interested in Tolkien, please take a look at my Tolkien channel, The Folksy Friend. Next week, I'll be talking about the complicated social landscape of Beleriand, which is in the far west of Middle Earth, before one of the biggest and most horrific battles that that land ever saw. So if you're interested in that, you can take a look then. Thanks again for spending some time with me here today. I hope you have a fantastic weekend. I'm going to try to post twice next week. I can't make any promises, but I'm going to try to do a myth and a story. So we shall see. Thanks again. Please subscribe, like, let me know what you think, and I will see you next time.